All right, so we have been in our series, Daniel Tough as Nails, and the idea behind it is culture is always shifting. Culture is always moving in various directions, and we acknowledge the fact that the culture is rarely ever moving towards God. It's usually moving away from God, and it's not a culture's fault type of thing. Uh, the reality is, is that uh, as people who follow Jesus Christ, our response is to, to be able to change the culture, to be able to stand strong when culture shifts. And so the question is, are you able to and are you willing to stand and be tough as nails even when culture shifts away from you? Now, one of the things um, that has become very prevalent, uh, especially in our, uh, in our social media, right, the, the world of social media, is if something goes wrong, we post it usually, right? If something's horrible, like we've got a bad prognosis, we want people to pray for us, we're overwhelmed by something. Uh, you know, I just see this. Sometimes it's just a sentence, sometimes it's a paragraph long, and it's like, hey, please, you know, and then everyone starts responding, uh, and saying, oh, we'll pray for you or we'll do this. And then, uh, you know, a lot of times the, the result is, hey, you know, the prognosis uh, is better than what we expected. Uh, the thing came out and it turned out into our favor, all these things. And then you begin to see uh, people that love Jesus start posting things like, oh, well, God is good. Or prayer always works or things like that. And those sound really good, don't they? We would agree, those sound really good. My question is, is if the person comes back and goes, oh, the prognosis is worse than they initially said, is God still good? The prognosis or the thing that you thought was going to overwhelm you and wash over you and sink your ship, that happened. Does prayer still work? You see, it's when you think about it that way, you're like, well, yeah, so then why is it that it's only when things turn out the way we want, it's only when our circumstances turn into what we think they should be that we then proclaim God is good or God's worthy of our worship? You see, unintentionally, and I believe unpurposefully, I don't think it's an intentional or purposeful thing by us as human beings or individuals. But because, and, and I don't say this in a negative way, because as Americans, we have it so good. And if you go, I don't think we have it so good, let me just tell you, spend some time outside the United States for a little bit. And I'm not being sarcastic. I'm not saying I don't like some of the things that are going on because I don't. I don't like seeing some of the things that are happening in our culture and our world. But I guarantee you, you spend some time in a third world country doing something, and you will be very thankful for all the things you have and the privileges you have as an American. And I think the reality is, is we have it so good that we have equated the good things in our life with God. And the things that aren't good or don't happen the way we want to with things that aren't from God. But the reality is, and I love this statement, it's, a, it's, it's an old school one. It actually uh, began to be created in Liberia uh, and Alberia as well when the Christians were being tortured and cut into pieces and shredded and fed to hogs and all those different things several decades ago. And the, the church began this mantra, and the mantra goes like this, the pastor would say, God is good, and the church would say, all the time. And then the pastor would say, and all the time, and the church would say, God is good. And I think that's a really important thing for us to remember, that the goodness of God is not attached to our perceived goodness of circumstance. And that's a hard thing for us to really grasp. Because let's be honest, and I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the same boat with you. If I pray for something, then something that I believe is bad is happening in my life, and I pray and I go, God, I want this to end. I want this to move. I want this to be resolved in this particular situation. And it doesn't happen that way. I, I'm going to be real honest with you, and don't be like, oh, I am disappointed with God. Ever been there? But it doesn't change who God is or the worthiness of God. Our big idea today 
is God's worthiness of my worship is neither increased nor decreased based upon my circumstances. So God's worthiness of my worship. So that's a very important word. The word worthiness means that, that he is worthy, okay? In fact, the word worship is actually just a, an English transliteration, if you will, of the word worship, which means he is worthy of worship. And worship means he is something bigger, better, more, uh, more abundant than I am, greater than I am. You cannot worship something that is less than you are. It just doesn't make any sense. And so worship is always upward. And so God's worthiness of our worship is unchanging. If you are having a bad day, God is still fully worthy of your worship. If you are having a good day, your worship shouldn't be any louder than it was the day before, which was a bad day. God's worthiness of your worship doesn't change based upon your circumstances. Now, let's all be real honest for a moment. It doesn't feel that way, does it? In fact, when you're having a bad day, isn't it true, or wouldn't you agree with me, that usually those are the days you find it the most difficult to worship? But those are the days when we should be worshiping the most, because it changes our perspective. Now today we're going to jump into a story that if you have been in church at any length of time, you know it, right? It's a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they go in the fiery furnace and everything happens and it's so cool and woo! It's a great story. It's a great story because we know the ending. We know it all works out. They didn't. Think about the times in your life when you went through something that was horrific and horrible and difficult and overwhelming, and it all turned out for the better, even if it didn't turn out the way that you anticipated it would. And if you knew the ending, you go, well, it would have been so much better to go through it. But the reality is, is we are linear people. We are linear human beings. We have to go through the process. But there is one who lives outside of time. His name is God. And he sees all the things that are going, and he doesn't see them in a linear way. He knows what they're happening yesterday, today, and forever. He knows how it's working. And so God is working through all of that. The Bible says that God works together for the good of those that love him and according to his purpose for his glory. And so everything that happens in our life, if we are following and we are in pursuit of Jesus Christ, then God can take it and he can use it for our benefit and for his glory. And so let's jump into it. Daniel chapter 3. Verse 1, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide and set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't measure in cubits anymore. Uh, so here we'll just do a really good, quick uh, you know, translation of that. It was 9 feet wide by 90 feet tall. This was not small. And it was covered in gold. You're like, what in the world is this all about? Why is this guy making this big image, this big statue in the middle of a big plain in a place that we don't even know anything about? Well, we have to go back to Daniel chapter 2. In Daniel chapter 2, God gave Nebuchadnezzar this dream of this giant statue. And a part of the giant statue was this giant, enormous head. And the Bible says is that he got this dream and it kind of worried him. It didn't, didn't really make him fearful, but it worried him because he couldn't figure out what it was. And so he called all the sages and the mages and the magicians and the wise men. And he says, listen, I had this dream and I want you to interpret it. And they're like, well, just tell us what the dream is and we'll, we'll tell you what it is. He's like, no, I'm not going to tell you the dream because I believe you're all fakes. I think you'll tell me what you want to hear. And so he goes, you tell me my dream first and then interpret. And they're like, well, that's impossible. Nobody can do that. And I love King Nebuchadnezzar's response. He goes, well, if you are actually hearing from the gods, you'd be able to do it. And so they don't. They can't tell it. And so he issues this decree that all the sages and the mages and the wise men and the magicians, they're going to be executed, terminated, because he has determined that they are all fakes. Well, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were still the young guys at this point in time, and they heard that this was happening. They were going to be part of the sages, the mages, the magicians, and the wise men. And so Daniel goes, hey, time out. Hang on just a second. Give us an opportunity here. 
And so they're like, all right, we'll give you an opportunity. So Daniel and his three friends, they fast and they pray overnight. And the next morning, Daniel wakes up and he goes, I've got it. So he goes into King Nebuchadnezzar. He says, Nebuchadnezzar, here's your dream. The dream is this statue that's made up of all these different parts. And it's all the different kingdoms that are going to be coming throughout the world. But you are the head of this statue because yours is the greatest, longest lasting empire that we're going to see until the new millennium turns around. You are an awesome dude. You start this whole thing off. Well, guess what happens in Daniel chapter 3? Nebuchadnezzar is so arrogant that he builds the statue. He goes, look at my statue. And he builds a statue of himself 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide, and he covers it in gold. I don't know about you, but that's, that's pretty, uh, that's like, you know, I don't know, one of these, I don't know, maybe like LeBron James making a statue of himself. Um, not a Braun fan. Okay, so... Now we jump into Daniel chapter 3, and we see this massive statue, and he's built it. He's built it in this plain called Dura, and the, the Bible historians and archaeologists tell us that this plain uh, was so large that it estimated 300,000 people could stand all at one time in this open area, this open field, and they could all see this statue all at the same time. And so what he does is he says, listen, here's, here's what I want to do. He sends this decree out to everyone in the empire, and he tells them, that on such and such day, as many of them as can, needs to come to this big, big field, this big plain called Dura. And he's going to bring this huge orchestra with all these different instruments. And what he wants them to do is when they hear the orchestra start playing, they're all to drop face down on the ground, and they are to worship the image that he has set up, an image of himself. Nebuchadnezzar is literally declaring himself God. He goes, I am now a God, and I want you to worship my image above all other gods. And so it begins to happen, just the way that he has dictated it as it should. And now, you got to get this picture in your mind, okay? There's this 90-foot tall statue, gold statue, shimmering, sunlight, glistening all over, right? And there's 300,000 people plus in this open field all standing there waiting for the instruments to start. Now, to get a really good picture, this last Indy 500 that happened uh, just a few weeks ago, there was an estimated 300,000 people that, that came to the Indy 500. Now, those of you that were there, those of you that chose to go there instead of going to church, so, but no, I'm, just te I'm teasing, I'm teasing. Those of you that were there, can you imagine? Now, think about that, right? This, this two and a half mile oval of all these people surrounding this, taking all those people and putting them on a flat surface in this big open area surrounded by or surrounding this nine foot wide, 90 foot tall, gold shimmering statue and the orchestra begins to play. And 299,997 people fall flat on their face and three guys are still standing. They stuck out more than a 50 year old man at a Taylor Swift concert. I'm going to tell you right now, if you're a 50-year-old dude at a Taylor Swift concert, you better be a dad or you're a pedophile. I'm just saying that's just the reality of it. If you are 50 years old and you like Taylor Swift, okay, so anyways, but think about that. That is how, I mean, like literally, can you imagine how they felt? Can you imagine how these guys felt? Everyone was going, dude, get down. Get down. And they're like, no. We're not going to get down. Now, some of the sniveling, whining, brown-nosing, jealous, suck-ups, not that I know, go running to King Nebuchadnezzar. The Bible tells us these guys go running up to him. Go, oh, King Nebuchadnezzar. You can just hear it in the language there. If you want to read it later, I encourage you to. Because they're like, oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, live forever. By the way, we bowed to your statue. But there are three guys, in fact, they happen to be three guys you kind of like, because remember, Daniel chapter 1 ends, and the king says these guys are 10 times better than everybody else. So they are jealous of them because the king has relied on them for the last decade for information and wisdom and knowing to make the right decisions, and these are his three favorite people plus Daniel. And so they say, hey, listen, your three favorite dudes, your three favorite Jews... They didn't bow down and worship you. 
I think you should do something about that king because, I mean, that really tarnishes your image, doesn't it? So we'll pick up the story in verse 13. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold that I have set up? He goes, are, are, are you, after all I've done for you, after the elevation that I've made for you in, in my kingdom, you are in my royal court. I have made you provincial governors. I have put you as a part of my parliament. You are some of my, my closest advisors. And you have betrayed me this way? Are you serious? Now, when you hear the sound, and I love this, listen to all these instruments, the horn, the flute, the zither. Anyone know what a zither is? No? Someone know? Like, a, we'll go with that. Okay. The horn, the flute, the kazoo, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all other kinds of music. He, like, forgets all the instruments. He's like, okay, they're all there. If you are ready to fall down and worship the image I have made, very good. All will be forgiven. But if you do not worship, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God, little g, by the way, will be able to rescue you from, from what? In my hand. Boy, you talk about a dude that is full of himself. He's like, listen, you refused to bow down to me. You betrayed me this way. I'm going to give you one more chance, and I'm going to lay it down law. Here's the reality. If you do not worship me when the zither plays, I'm going to throw you in the fiery furnace, and you know what? No God's going to be able to save you. Man, you can just hear him. He is seething with anger. And he literally says, if you don't do this, I'm going to personally see to it that you burn. You ever had somebody so against you before? I mean, think about that for a second. What's crazy is that we downplay in our minds because we don't understand the context because we've never had to live that way. The Nebuchadnezzar is an absolute dictator. What he says goes. He is the emperor, the king of the greatest kingdom the world has ever seen at this point in time. He is the most powerful ruler the world has ever seen up to this moment. Historically, he has more power in this moment than any other leader has ever had. And he is looking at them and saying, I'm going to, because I like you guys, I'm going to give you a second chance. I'm going to let you know right now, if you don't do it, I will personally make you pay. The problem is, is that they're being told they're to worship a false god, a god that doesn't even exist. And they go, but our god, the god of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the God of the Jews, is real. And we have been taught our whole lives that there is only one God, and we will worship that God alone. And they're at a crossroads. They're being told by those in authority to do something that violates the truth of what they've been taught from the Word of God. And in this moment, we see them say, I would rather serve God and die than to obey you. Now that is a powerful stance to take, is it not? Their response, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. Now, whoa, they're like, whoa, what? Like, hey, we don't need to defend ourselves. We're not going to stand here and try to explain it to you. You've heard it from us before. We don't serve any other gods but our God, period. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. Now that, we're like, yeah, amen, we believe that, right? Do you believe it enough to actually be thrown in the furnace? It's easy to say it on the safe side of things. They didn't know how it was going to turn out, did they? 
They said, listen, we know and we believe that that furnace that you're about ready to throw us into, that if God chose to, he has the power and the availability to deliver us from it. In other words, he will keep us from even having to go into it. And then he goes this, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. They're like, listen, you think you're all powerful, but the truth is no matter what happens from this point forward, we will be delivered from your hand because God's hand is bigger than yours. And I love this. But even if he does not, if you've got your notes in front of you, I want you to underline, I want you to circle that because this is so important for us today as Christians. They say, our God is worthy of our worship. And our circumstances do not change His worthiness. Now, if God delivers us, great. But even if He doesn't, it doesn't change a thing. Now, we read that, we're like, yeah, yeah, good for them. But what about us? They go on, they say, we want you to know, Your Majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. God's worthiness of our worship neither increases or decreases by my circumstances. They look right at old Nebi and they say, listen, man, King, thank you for the second chance. But no matter how many times you blow that zither thingy, we are not going to bow down. The only God that we worship, the only God that is worthy of our worship is the God of Israel. And King, I know that you are the most powerful man on the planet right now, but our God is way more powerful than you. And he has more than enough power to deliver us if he chooses to. And no matter what happens, he will deliver us from your hand because if we die, we're still delivered from your hand. And as you can imagine, that didn't go over well. Listen to what he says. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious. He was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude towards them changed. I love this. I, I love the way that the, the Word of God just lays this out for us because you can see it play out, can't you? He hears it first that his, his best guys have decided not to do that, and so in him he's, he's angry, but he still sees them with, with, with love, and he still sees them with attention. He's still, they're still kind of his favorites. And so he goes, I'm going to give you a second chance. I wouldn't do this for anybody else, guys, but I'm doing it for you, just for you. I like you guys. And they're like, hey, sorry, we're not going to do it. And so now his attitude sours. He's like, I am. Because here's the thing, right? When you feel betrayed by somebody that you thought you could be protected by, you become even more angry than if you were betrayed by somebody you didn't like in the first place. And that's what happens. He loses it. Listen to what he says. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, their trousers, their turbans, and their clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace was so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Have you ever done the right thing and it blew up in your face? Have you ever done the thing that God said you were supposed to do and it only got worse? In that moment... Don't you think to yourself, I should have just reacted the way I wanted to. Couldn't get any worse. They literally went from bad to worse to completely gone. It was over with. In fact, the Bible says the fire was so hot that the big strong dudes, right, the guys who've been pumping iron and testosterone, steroids, all that stuff, 
wrapped these guys up, threw them over their shoulders, and went to throw them in the fiery furnace. And as they bent in to throw them over, the flames came up and killed those dudes instantly. It killed them instantly. Now, this wasn't just some ordinary furnace hanging out in the middle of a plane somewhere. Like, oh, did he have that? Is that his killing furnace? No. Remember I told you last week, they were the first empire, the first known army to, to smelt iron and use it for their weapons. And so all over Babylon, they had these smelting furnaces. Now, just to give you an idea, I, I, I did some, my geekiness comes out. So if you're not that, you just, just deal with me for a minute. So they had these smelting furnaces all over the, of the empire. And so most likely that's what this was. Now, to smelt iron, the furnace would have had to have been at least 3,200 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hot. So it melts or smelts iron at 3,200 degrees Fahrenheit, and you purify it, you get all the stuff out of it. So seven times hotter is between 18 and 20,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Now I know you're like, well, that's hyperbole. Yes, it may be. So to give you an idea of how hot that is, lava, lava at its hottest is 2,200 degrees. 2,200 degrees. Uh, steel melts at 2,800 degrees. Glass melts at 3,100 degrees. Fire bricks, the things that you make forges out of, right, that keep it from burning, fire bricks melt at 3,200 degrees. Diamonds melt at 6,500 degrees. And skin melts at 162 degrees. So think about it. Even if he just got it two times hotter, that furnace was so hot, it could melt diamonds. The furnace temperature was an indicator of the rage that the king had. He was insulted and he was furious. The circumstances could not have been worse, but Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew that God's worthiness of their worship didn't increase or decrease based upon their circumstances, no matter how hot the fire got. They knew that when they stood before God, they would be thankful that they didn't bow before Nebuchadnezzar. That's what their mind was thinking. Do your circumstances determine your worship? Do your circumstances and how you view them determine whether or not you believe God is capable and able to deliver you? We view our circumstances or our fires as horrific and terrible and not a good thing. And therefore, God always needs to deliver us from it. Always. God always needs to deliver us from it. And when He doesn't, our faith is shaken. And the reality is that often this happens multiple times. And so we begin to question God. And we begin to question the, the goodness of God or God's ability to deliver us. And we think it must be then our job to deliver ourselves and to pick ourselves up from our bootstraps. And, and we're going to make this work. What's even worse is that when the good things happen, we praise God. But when the bad things happen, we either ignore God, try to fix it ourselves, or worse yet, blame God. But God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. Today, I want to challenge you to think differently about the fires in your life. The circumstances, the fires of your life are not meant by God to destroy you. The fires of your life are the proving ground of your faith. It is through the fires, the testing facility of God, that deepens, develops, and expands your faith. God literally uses the fires of our lives not to destroy us, but to deliver us. We're going to see in just a minute that the very weapon that King Nebuchadnezzar wanted to use to destroy Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was the very thing that delivered them. But for just a moment, I want to keep it on you and your circumstances because I want to share with you that no matter what fire you're going through, God can use it to make your faith stronger. And there are three ways that God can deliver you through your fires. Number one, if He delivers us from 
the fire. In other words, we don't have to go through it. In this scenario, King Nebuchadnezzar goes, okay, guys, I see that your faith is strong. I'm not going to put you through this. So if God delivers you from the fire, your faith is built, right? If something comes up and you pray and you ask God to give you the ability and, and you're ready for it, and then all of a sudden God removes it all together, you're like, whoo, man, God is good, right? That is our normal response. God is good. Prayer works. We're so thankful. But what happens if God doesn't deliver you from the fire? What happens if he does the next thing? If he delivers you through the fire? In other words, he doesn't take it away. He takes you through it. If God delivers you through the fire, your faith is refined. It's just like a furnace, right? It's just like a smelting thing. When you, when you smelt silver down or you smelt iron down or you smelt these things down, all the impurities bubble to the top and they skim that off and what's left is a pure form of what they started with. And that's what God often does with the fires in your life. He doesn't deliver you from them, but He delivers you through them and your fire is stronger. It's pure. There's more to it. And I know many of you have gone through fires in your life and you go, man, now I see that looking back. I am a strong believer in God. I believe God can give us more strength. I believe God can make us through this because my faith has been purified and my faith is stronger because of this. But what if what if the fire takes us? If He delivers us by the fire then our faith is perfected. You see if you know Jesus Christ, this life isn't the end. And that's a hard thing to think about, isn't it? You see, sometimes the fire is the vehicle by which God delivers us into His presence. You go, well, that doesn't sound very exciting. It may not be when you look at it. But just like every circumstance that you've gone through on the other side, you're like, wow, I wouldn't say I liked it, but I'm thankful that it's made me who I am. It's exactly what this is. And that's exactly what Daniel, or that's exactly what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were saying to the king. Even if God doesn't deliver us from the fire, he will deliver us from your hand and deliver us into his presence. And our faith will be made perfect and we will forever be with the Lord. Now that's faith. You see, the fire doesn't have to be something that you desire to avoid because you know God can use it for His glory and for your benefit because God's worthiness of our worship isn't dependent upon and it doesn't increase or decrease based upon our circumstance. It alters the way that we see the fire because we know that God is able. We know that God is able to deliver us. And if God can do something, we say, but the reality is we know that God can and we know that God will and He's going to use it to develop and refine and grow and perfect me. Isaiah 54, 17 says this, no weapon forged against you will prevail. I love this. Joseph said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. God can take the worst fire in your life and He can turn it around for your benefit and for God's glory. And I love the fact that when we do a little research, we find out that the furnace wasn't just a furnace, it was a forge. And so according to this, God can't just take any weapon that's forged against you. He can take the very forge itself and turn it for His glory and for your benefit. And I want you to see this. God has promised to take any and every weapon that is forged and use it to defeat the things that are against you and to strengthen you. And in Daniel chapter 3, as we wrap this up, we're going to see this, but suddenly. So again, remember, they're all watching from a distance because we're talking six to 15,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The dudes that took him in, the Samsons of the army, are now lying singed and crispy at the edge of the furnace. No one wants to go close. And so King Nebuchadnezzar is watching in rage. And then all of the sudden, he jumps up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? Now, can you imagine these advisors going, he's lost it. 
He's lost it. He just did this, and now he's asking, did we do this? Like, yes, your majesty, we certainly did. They replied, look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men unbound walking around in the fire, unharmed, and the fourth looks like a god. Nebuchadnezzar is watching all this and going, <laughs> and all of a sudden, his countenance changes. And he jumps up and he looks down and he sees the three men that he tied by the strongest men in the army who are now still lying, crispy dead, next to the furnace. And they are no longer tied and bound. Instead, they're walking around in a circle, chatting with each other, I'm assuming. I don't know. And he goes, but there's not three, there's four. And the fourth one looks like a god. What is going on? Then Nebuchadnezzar came as close as he could to the door of the flaming furnace, and he shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God. Notice that the little g now is a big G. Come out. Come here. And I love this. They are thrown into the fire that is burning hotter than any fire has burnt before. And now they are unbound and they are unharmed the very thing that was binding them, the fire delivered them from. Have you ever thought about that for just a second? Let that sink in for a moment. The very thing right now that you are bound to, that you are struggling with, the fire that you are avoiding may be the very thing that God uses to unleash you. He goes on. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego step out of the fire. I love that. Like, hey, what's up, guys? Can you imagine this picture? I don't know if the 300,000 people of Dura were still there or not, but they just walk out of the fire, walk past the three crispy guards out of the fire. And then the high officers and officials and governors and advisors crowded around them and saw that the fire had not touched them. Not a hair on their heads was singed and their clothing was not scorched and they didn't even smell of smoke. Can you picture this? I love this. This is so cool. The three guys throw them in. The three guys fall dead. They're all watching, waiting for the flames to come out. Nebuchadnezzar jumps up and goes, hey, hang on a second. Didn't we put three guys in there? Now there's four. They're walking unbounded. Unharmed. What is going on? Why don't you guys come on out? They come out. All the officials come surrounding them. They're going. <laughs> they stepped out of the fire. They didn't smell like smoke. They weren't singed and they weren't scorched. That's a wonderful alliteration, by the way. All the S's. Completely untouched by the very thing that was meant to destroy them. And the very thing that was meant to destroy them not only released them, but it gathered them a crowd by which they could see the power of God revealed in a way that had never been seen before. And all the officials and all the officers and all the royal court were surrounding them, now going, wow, your God is really God. Watch this. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, he sent his angel to rescue his servants who trusted him. They defied the king's command and were willing to die rather than serve or worship any god, little g, except their own god, big g, therefore I make this decree. The guy that just decreed everybody serve and worship me is now going to make a different decree. And let's see how it's changed. If any people, whatever their race or nation or language, speak a word against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they will be torn limb from limb. That's a big change, wouldn't you say? I'm going to burn you. I'm going to tear anyone else apart limb from limb who sees anything against you guys. And their houses will be turned into heaps of rubble. There is no other God who can rescue like this. See, sometimes the fire isn't even about you. Sometimes the fire in your life God uses to show other people who He is 
so other people can serve him too. And then I love how it ends. They get pulled out or they step out of the furnace. They don't stink like fire. In fact, I think everyone around them probably stunk more like fire than they did. And then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to even higher positions in the province of Babylon. God's worthiness of our worship is neither increased or decreased based upon our circumstances. We're going to close today by singing a couple songs. And as we sing these songs, I want to challenge you to come face to face with those fires in your life that have been causing you to question the worthiness of God. And as you think about those things, I want to challenge you. In your mind, you can say out loud if you want to, in your mind or out loud, however you want to, go, God, your worthiness of my worship isn't increased or decreased by my circumstance. So I will worship you regardless. I will worship you no matter what because you are worthy. So as we sing these next couple songs, I just want to invite you. Maybe you can't even sing. Maybe you're like, no, I, I am a little too overwhelmed. And you sit there and you allow it to wash over you, and then you join in when you're ready. But I want to challenge you as we end this service today to embrace the worthiness of God and not your circumstances. Because God is worthy. Father, we we thank you. God, we thank you for these three men who were willing to stand and be tough as nails in the midst of an environment that was overwhelming. God, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure none of us have had to stand in the midst of 3,000 people and do what they did. I'm pretty sure none of us have had to been been threatened with being thrown in a smelting furnace if we didn't obey. But God, to be honest, there are some furnaces and some fires in our life that feel pretty real too. And God, I pray that in this moment our faith would begin to grow and mature and we would realize that, that, that the fires aren't against us. The fires you can use, God, if we, if you keep us from them, our faith grows. If you make us go through them, our faith grows. If you use that to deliver us into your presence, our faith is perfected. And so God, let us see the fires differently today. In fact, let us take our eyes off the fires. Let's get a bigger picture of who you are. And God, as we sing, let us just with full-throated worship just say how awesome our God is. And God, we thank you for that. And we pray this in Jesus' awesome and holy name, the one who is worthy of our worship. Amen. Let's stand and respond.